Okay, so welcome to this next video on smooth muscle contraction. So we've now looked at the uh, structure of a smooth muscle cell and how, uh, by contracting these contractile units and getting the myosin filaments to climb up the actin filaments, we can produce contraction of the entire smooth muscle cell. What we now want to look at is how we can activate contraction in the smooth muscle cell. So basically, um, one of the key um, key um, neurotransmitters which can be used to stimulate smooth muscle cells to contract is acetylcholine. So actually I'll put it down here. So let's have a look at the structure of acetylcholine and then we'll look at what it's going to do to the smooth muscle cell. Okay, so acetylcholine. Okay, so acetylcholine is basically acetic acid esterified with choline. So, uh, let me show you its structure. So, acetylcholine, here is the acetyl group here. So, you have um, a carbonyl group here, and then a methyl group off here. So, if that then had a hydroxyl group down here, it would be acetic acid. What you've done is you've esterified this with a hydroxyl group on the choline molecule. So here's the oxygen from the hydroxyl group of this choline molecule. And then continuing the choline molecule on, you then have two methylene groups like so. And then on the end, you have a nitrogen. And then with off this nitrogen comes three methyl groups. So the nitrogen has got one more bond than it would like to have. Nitrogen usually likes to uh, form only three bonds. So that means that nitrogen ends up with a positive charge, basically, because it's donated one of these um, bonds that it's formed. It will have donated both electrons, basically, rather than um, donating one and receiving another from the other um, constituent of the covalent bond. Okay, so that's the structure of acetylcholine. This is the acetyl bit here, and this is the choline bit here. All right, so acetylcholine has uh, receptors on uh, the smooth muscle cell, which are G-protein coupled receptors. So let's draw one of these in here. Okay, so G-protein coupled receptors have these seven transmembrane domains, like so. And the specific um, type of a receptor for acetylcholine that smooth muscle cells generally have in them is a receptor known as the M3 muscarinic receptor. Muscarinic. And then if you want to be full, maybe you should put muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. Acetylcholine receptor. Okay, right. So muscarinic acetylcholine receptors are often abbreviated to M for muscarinic, then A, C, H for acetylcholine, and then R for receptor. So this is the M3 muscarinic acetylcholine. Oops, sorry, you can't see that. M3 muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. Okay, right, so now let's go down here and uh, look at the pathways that um, the M3 muscarinic acetylcholine receptor is involved in. So basically, I told you it's a G-protein coupled receptor, so let's draw it out bigger down here. Okay, so here's the phospholipid by there. Here are the seven membrane-spanning alpha helices. One, two, three, four, five, and then six and seven there. Okay, and this is the M3 receptor, the M3 muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. Okay, now basically it's a G-protein coupled receptor, and specifically the G-protein it's coupled to is a GQ heterotrimeric G-protein. So let's show this down here. So, heterotrimeric G-proteins consist of three subunits here. They consist of an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, and a gamma subunit. So let's say this is alpha, this is beta, and this is gamma. Now, when you want to build a heterotrimeric G protein, there are a huge number of different uh, ways you can do it because there are 16 alpha proteins that you can use. So there are 16 different genes in the human genome, all encoding for slightly different proteins, which can all be used uh, as an alpha protein in a heterotrimeric G protein. Then for beta, there are five different uh, beta subunits you can use. And for gamma, there are 12 different gamma subunits you can use. So that gives a huge scope for a diverse collection of heterotrimeric G proteins that you're capable of building. Now, if this um, G protein is GQ, what that means 
is it means that the alpha subunit is a specific one of these 16. So basically, heterotrimeric G proteins are named after what their alpha subunit is, not what their beta and their gamma subunit are. So basically, in the name of a G protein, all you know, sorry, in the name of a heterotrimeric G protein, all you know, basically, is what alpha subunits being used. You don't know what beta and gamma subunits are being used. Okay, so if the um, G protein in question, if the heterotrimeric G protein in question is an alpha Q, oh, sorry, it's a GQ heterotrimeric G protein, it means that this alpha subunit is alpha Q. Okay, right. So, um, heterotrimeric G proteins have both an on and an off state. Now, when they are in their off state, the alpha subunit is bound to GDP, or guanosine diphosphate. Okay? Now, to turn them into their on state, you need to remove that guanosine diphosphate and replace it with a guanosine triphosphate, basically. Okay, so uh, that's where the M3 receptor is going to come in. Basically, the M3 receptor, which I'll draw here in blue, uh, when acetylcholine binds to this M3 receptor, what's going to happen is the M3 receptor is going to gain catalytic activity, and the reaction it's going to catalyze is the breaking off of this GDP molecule from the alpha Q subunit. So this is alpha Q here, so let me color that in as well. So alpha Q is here in orange. Okay, so it's going to catalyze the breaking off of the GDP from the alpha Q, and then it will take a GTP, a guanosine triphosphate molecule, from the cytoplasm of the cell, and it will bind guanosine triphosphate to the alpha Q uh, subunit instead. So you'll get GTP bound to the alpha Q subunit. And now uh, the G protein is in its on state, basically. When you bind um, the GTP to the alpha subunit, that's going to turn the G protein on. Okay, right. So, how, do, how does the M3 receptor catalyze this reaction? Well, well, how does it get access to the GQ? Uh, well, G protein coupled receptors can either be physically linked to the inactive G protein, i.e. this one is physically bonded to this one, or the G protein, the inactive heterotrimeric G protein, can just be whizzing around, uh, bound to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there. So this is the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there, this inner layer of phospholipids that comprises the phospholipid by there. So basically, heterotrimeric G proteins in the inactive state so more, a lot of them are bound to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there, and therefore they, the M3 receptor will have access to them when it becomes catalytically active. Alternatively, occasionally there are some um, examples of G protein couple receptors which will be physically linked to their um, heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, so onwards with the story then. We now have this alpha Q GTP complex over here. That's a name that you will often see people refer to this as. Uh, and basically, when you bind GTP to the alpha Q subunit, it no longer wants to associate with the beta and the gamma subunit, so they go off on their own little adventure. So this, these two subunits together are often considered together, even though they are separate proteins. And they're often called the beta-gamma subunit. So we'll put them over here. Okay, and uh, basically, once the alpha Q subunit has been has had GTP bound to it, it no longer wants to bind to this beta gamma subunit. So beta gamma subunit then goes off on its own. Okay, and what we're going to see now is what's going to happen to this alpha Q GTP. So I'll get another piece of paper and we'll discuss what's going to happen to the alpha Q GTP. Okay, right. So, let's redraw out this alpha QGTP now, uh, because that's going to carry the signal from now on. The acetylcholine has bound to the M3 receptor, and what that's caused is the activation of this alpha Q subunit. It's turned on the alpha Q subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein, and now this on state of the alpha Q G protein is going to, um, is going to catalyze, the, well, it's going to carry the signal further. Okay, so basically what it's going to do is it's going to activate an enzyme in the membrane of the cell. So let's see this mem en enzyme here. Okay, and this enzyme is known as phospholipase C, 
and it's specifically of the beta type. So there are many different types of phospholipase C enzymes. The ones which are activated by alpha QGTP are phospholipase C beta enzymes. So this is phospholipase C beta enzyme. Phospholipase C and it's of the beta type. Now, Basically, alpha-QGTP subunits are going to come and bind to this phospholipase C beta enzyme, and they are going to activate the phospholipase C beta enzyme. So phospholipase C beta is going to become activated. So, so far, acetylcholine being um, released onto the cell is going to activate the phospholipase C beta enzymes in the uh, phospholipid bilayer of that cell. So, we now want to know what is phospholipase C beta going to do. Well, it's going to do what all phospholipase C enzymes do, which is it's going to uh, break down a component of the membrane. So, let me show you uh, what um, component of the membrane that I'm on about. It's going to break down a component known as PIP2, and I think I'll draw this down here. Okay, so basically, uh, before I show you PIP2, I want to show you the usual component of the phospholipid by there. So the normal component of the phospholipid by there is phospholipids. And phospholipids, their structure can be cartoonly shown like this. So uh, they have these two hydrophobic tails, as they're called here, which I'm drawing in green, which are basically the long chain carboxylic acid tails, uh, which are esterified to the first and the second hydroxyl groups of uh, the glycerol molecules. These are fatty acids, or if you're a chemist, they are long chain carboxylic acids. Right, okay, and uh, they, um, they have very, very long hydrocarbon tails, uh, which are very hydrophobic usually, and they interact well together, but not very well with water. So they all sort of group together in this hydrophobic core of the phospholipid by there. So you'll have multiple phospholipids, and they'll all have their hydrophobic tails sticking into this hydrophobic core of the phospholipid by there, and they'll all interact very nicely with each other because they're all very lipophilic. Okay. Then, um, this sort of backbone for the entire phospholipid is this glycerol molecule, which I'll show in orange, which is this horizontal line here. So this is glycerol. Or again, if you're a chemist, the proper name for glycerol is um, propane 1,2,3-triol. And basically, it's a free carbon hydrocarbon uh, with hydroxyl groups coming off every single one of the carbons. Okay, so propane one, two, three trial. And now, off the first and second hydroxyl groups, you've had these fatty acids esterified to those. But the third hydroxyl group, instead, what you have is a phosphate group linked to that hydroxyl group. So here in pink, this little ball here is a phosphate group. Okay, uh, and that basically is the structure of phospholipid, basically. Uh, so you have these. Um, this, these two um, long-chain carboxylic acids are stereified with glycerol and then a phosphate group. So this entire thing is a phospholipid, a normal phospholipid. So the phospholipid by there consists of absolutely loads of these um, in two layers with the hydrophobic tails all interacting with one another. So another one would be up here, maybe, like so. Okay, and um, they all have the hydrophobic tails interacting with each other, and the polar heads, these phosphate groups are polar because they've got a negative charge, those stick out towards the cytoplasm or the extracellular fluid and interact with the water. Okay, now another name for a phospholipid is a phosphatidate molecule. Phosphatidate molecule. And uh, knowing that other name for a phospholipid is going to be helpful in a moment when we discuss PIP2, but we'll do that in the next video.